And now I can stop padding because the premiere has arrived. <laughs> Thank uh, Emma for that introduction, which I'm sure was <laughs> fantastic. That's right. Your laughter is less than reassuring. <laughs> uh, can I begin my remarks by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my deep personal respects to Elders past and present. And uh, I know Jill Gallagher is going to be speaking a bit later on and it's a great pleasure to be able to share the stage with her. And, to thank and acknowledge her for the work that she's doing as our Treaty Advancement Commissioner and the acknowledgement that I just made, I make with a real sense of pride uh, as a Victorian knowing that last week the Lower House of the Parliament passed uh, the, the Treaty Bill. Uh, there's a long way to go in that process but that's Victoria at its best I think, leading our nation and leading the way. To think, that it's, to think that it's 30 years since the uh, Barunga Statement, which was presented to Bob Hawke all those years ago, we have made progress in lots of ways and we can report better outcomes against some metrics. Uh, others, I think, are far less hopeful. And I don't say that you know, to, be, to be smart about it. It's, that's an insight, I think, that many people are making or drawing across Aboriginal affairs, right across not just Victoria but our entire nation. And the refresh provides us with an opportunity uh, not just to set new targets and new goals and to recommit ourselves to trying to meet those, but it also presents us with an opportunity and I think a fundamental, a fundamental obligation to recast the way that, that closing the gap narrative and empowerment and justice for Aboriginal Australians is framed. I think it is in desperate need to be a much more positive discussion. Not to move away from or not to in any way diminish our commitment to dealing with fundamental injustice and some very negative issues and very negative outcomes for Koolies and for Aboriginal Australians more broadly. But to make it a conversation that is not just about Aboriginal people, but one that is led by Aboriginal people. Um, Jill taught me wearing another hat many years ago when I had the great honour and privilege of being the Health Minister uh, and before then the Parliamentary Secretary for Health uh, and looking at the way Aboriginal controlled healthcare organisations work, uh, it taught me a valuable and indeed lifelong policy lesson and that was that better outcomes for Aboriginal people can only come if they are delivered by Aboriginal people. So uh, that's off script but I thought an important mm. point to make just only a few days uh, after we made those, that very big, that very big step, uh, one that is just the beginning in some respects uh, to, a, to a process that will take time uh, and will not be easy. I also want to acknowledge, uh, I think uh, Samantha Ratnam is here, Fiona Patton, Georgie Crozier, I think uh, Matthew Guy will be joining you later on, to, to Emma and to Stella and to board members, all the team. Uh, being here today is an opportunity for me to thank you for the work that you do in so many different ways. It's always challenging work. Nothing about what you do is easy. But then again, important work never is easy. And we perhaps don't pause often enough to say thank you. We don't pause often enough just to reflect on that very challenging work and how you get about, in lots of different ways, making Victoria fairer and stronger, uh, more equal, more just. Uh, and so much of your work is at, at the forefront of the national leadership that I think all Victorians crave. We all want to play that role. We all want to be the centre of critical thought and policy development, the centre of innovation in the best sense of that term, to solve complex problems, never to shy away from them. And uh, as I said, we, we perhaps don't often enough say thank you. So from my team and indeed on behalf of all Victorians, I do very much profoundly thank you for the work and the commitment for the thinking uh, and for, for your passion, for your passion for what is undoubtedly challenging and often extremely difficult work. Now, four years ago, I stood, not here, but I stood at a similar gathering and I made some commitments around 
putting people first and laying out an agenda to try and make our state fairer and stronger, an agenda that in many respects aligns with your charter and the work that you do. Uh, today's not an opportunity for me to be bragging and boasting and going through that long laundry list of everything that the government has done. I'll touch on some of the things that we've done uh, and then I want to talk about one particular example where we made some commitments and we've delivered and continue to deliver, not in a triumphant sense, there's still a long way to go in that particular area. And then I want to talk briefly, um, but hopefully to give you an insight pretty clearly about another area where I think we need to do more work, not just as a government, but as a Victorian community. Uh, I do have an announcement to make though before then, which I think will be welcomed, at least I hope so. I've been assured that it'll be welcomed, so there's no pressure there at all. But, um, no, no, it's all right. The, uh, the Fair Work Commission, as you well know, uh, finally uh, recognised uh, last year, and again just last week, I think, that there has been for too long a gap between what workers in this sector, this incredibly diverse and important sector, are paid and what a fair wage would be. Uh, we all know that our social community, home care and disability workers deserve a fairer go, deserve a better reward for that, as I said, very, very challenging work that you do in every setting, uh, every hour of every day, right across our state and indeed right across the nation. Uh, tireless and dedicated uh, and long overdue a substantial wage increase. But I do also, at the same time, as compelling as that case is, as important as it is to make that investment, it's also important that we acknowledge that so many of your organisations, perhaps indeed all of them, operate uh, on very tight budgets and never ever want to be put in, put in that difficult situation where you have to choose between the services you provide and the staff that you employ. Uh, that is a really difficult, very, very difficult position for any community service organisation to find itself in, any not-for-profit to find itself in. Uh, that's not a choice that you should have to make. So that's why I can tell you that we will fully cover the shortfall between the 2017 order uh, and the funding that you've been provided to this point. We are delighted to be able to do that and if we are re-elected we will make that uh, top up, we will make that an ongoing feature of our funding and our policy and our budget. Uh, for the next four years. So I knew, it, I knew I was accurately informed that that would be, that's, it's the right thing to do. And in relation to last week's order or the very recent order, the 2018 determination, uh, we'll continue to work with the sector and with VCOS. And I want to thank Emma and her team for having drawn this issue to our attention and having argued so effectively for us to take the step that I've just announced and we'll continue that process of engagement, that process of discussion uh, to see what can be done in relation to the most recent order. I don't want to leave your organisation short and I don't want to have to see, I don't want to have to, I don't want to see you having to choose between how many clients you support, the research you do, the questions you tackle, uh, all that challenge. I don't want an additional burden being a gap between what you funded and what you have to pay to your amazing staff. Uh, that's consistent, I think, with the announcement that I have just made. Now, I, I did say that I wouldn't go through that laundry list, but I, I do think it is important uh, to acknowledge that there's been so much progress made in our state. And this is not about self-praise. It's about acknowledging that there are so many partnerships in this room where we have been able to work together to deliver what's important to you, what's important to us uh, and what's ultimately important in terms of supporting vulnerable Victorians through difficult times but also in an aspirational sense, in a much more positive sense, similar to the comments I made in relation to closing the gap. Ultimately, if we support people to reach their unique and full potential, then we as a state will reach ours. Uh, at the same time, those who are held back, those who are deprived of that important opportunity, that holds all of us back. We all pay a price in so many different ways. It can be a hopeful discussion. It sometimes needs to be a very pointed and sometimes a negative discussion uh, to motivate everyone uh, appropriately. But it is a hopeful agenda and we're very proud to have stuck to our values and stuck to our mission and uh, delivered on those commitments that we made, whether it be on this platform uh, four years ago 
uh, or in so many other different forums. We have come a long way and there's lots of different ways to measure that. Lots of different ways to measure it. None of this is triumphant. There's always much, much more to do. Always. But I'm proud that 25,000 kids now start every school day with a full stomach because of our Breakfast Club uh, initiative. Not something that had been done before. I was at a school in my own local community last week, as I so often am, uh, and uh, in one of the proud but very working class communities that I have the honour of, uh, uh, I have the honour of representing in the Victorian Parliament. Uh, and there's about 500 kids at this school. As I said, it is a proud school and it's a proud local community, but there's a lot of parents who do it very, very tough and therefore their kids do it tough. We, I asked the principal, uh, and I'd been there maybe two years before to uh, visit with the breakfast club when it was just starting. And I said, how many of your 500 kids do you feed every morning? And they said, we feed 250 kids. So we feed one in two. Now, if that's not making a profound difference to their ability to learn, to thrive, to reach that full and unique potential I spoke about before, if somebody can suggest something better than that, for a pretty modest investment on behalf of our government and a partnership with Food Bank and others, um, then I'm more than happy to listen to any other suggestions. But we're very proud to have done that. We're proud as well that 37,000 extra families are, better, uh, are benefiting from our extended maternal and child health services knowing that those early years are so critically important, those first thousand days are so important in terms of the life opportunities that those kids, as adults, will enjoy. Uh, they're not costs, they're profound investments, and they do open up all sorts of tremendous possibilities. I know that's an area where we can do more and perhaps we'll talk about early childhood education a bit later on. I'm very proud that more than 200,000, indeed 207,000 patients are now getting the surgery that they need much faster. And to be able to get that surgery uh, means something to each, in, each individual patient, but access to care is so often more important for those who are doing it a bit tough, for those who rely upon government services a little more than some others. We've made substantial investments in social housing, in trying to change the debate in homelessness so that it's much more about not just more stock, which is very important, but also personalised, tailored, bespoke services so that the underlying causes of uh, housing insecurity and homelessness can be dealt with. Uh, and Martin Foley, with a real sense of pride and an equal sense of purpose, um, has been pursuing that agenda, and I'm very proud of that work. Again, much more to do in that space as well. Uh, we have brought TAFE back from the brink, because I know that skills underpin jobs, and jobs are all about that empowerment and economic participation opportunity that I think all of us could uh, essentially agree on. We're making 30 priority training courses completely free, dealing with a gap in funding that can be a real barrier, a real barrier to people undertaking that training. Uh, that'll make TAFE better than it's ever been and I think open up possibilities for so many people who, without that sort of initiative, may well have been held back from the skills that they need for the job that they want and the future that they are entitled to. We uh, are rebuilding hospitals and schools in every corner of the state. Uh, we do understand the power of skills attainment, a, a, a good start, every chance in life being central to the best educational offering. We're building 70 new schools, unheard of levels of investment, brand new, 70 of them. We're upgrading another 1,200. Uh, that is really very important. Uh, it also creates a lot of jobs along the way and gives to that part of the construction sector, as do all of our projects in road and rail, uh, level crossing removals. It gives to different parts of the construction sector the certainty, the order book that they have never had. And that, that does have a profound effect in a broader sense. Uh, I'll, if I get a chance later on, if someone's kind enough to ask me about social procurement, then I'll talk about just how much we are using the power of the government's purchase to drive the best outcomes. These are some of our proudest achievements from a personal point of view. In fact, I won't bother relying upon someone to ask me. Let me just, <laughs> let me just move away for one, for, one, for one second. I was out uh, on... Uh, Skyrail, the removal of those nine level crossings between Caulfield and Dandenong, just recently. And I met a fellow out there and had a bit of a chat to him. And I knew that raw recruitment, Michael Long and his firm, 
uh, Royal Recruitment was doing a great job for us. But when I was told that there were 280 uh, Aboriginal workers on that job, I was very, very pleased about that. I was very, very pleased. Uh, then, someone who'd be mid-50s, uh, he tapped me on the shoulder and wanted to take me to one side and just have a little bit of a chat to me. And he said, look, I've had some problems in my life. I've, I was inside for a bit. Uh, but this job, this opportunity, through social procurement has changed my life. And I said, OK, tell me how it's changed your life. And he says, well, I've paid off all my debts. My troubled past, the, the bad bits from my past, well, they're, they are a distant memory. And I had a meeting last week with a bank manager about borrowing some money for a house. Unheard of for him. None of those things should be luxuries. None of those things should be all that special. But for him, and so many more, and it's not just Aboriginal Victorians, we've got veterans working in our construction sector as well because of our social procurement. We've got people who have had other troubles with the law, for instance. There's a, there's a long list of people who are in work because we understand that as the biggest purchaser of goods and services in the state, we have an obligation to make sure that we are embedding, through local content and social procurement, Victorian jobs, Victorian skills, and the sorts of experiences that change lives and, you might argue, actually save lives. Uh, I could if Martin Foley were here and Sean Lean and other members of our team, they could literally take you through uh, an hour's worth of stories in this social procurement sector. It's so important for us, uh, and it's the natural extension of a strong local content agenda, is not just to buy local but to buy fair and to buy smart. Because that empowerment, we all benefit in that, back to that central point about we all move forward together uh, if we can deal with every single person who might well be held back. Again, I've, I've diverted a little bit, but there, and I didn't want to give the big long laundry list, as I said. Uh, I'm very proud to think that we are partnering with VCOS and RMIT to deliver the Future Social Services Institute. That's part of a $26 million workforce plan uh, to deal with some of the challenges for our disability workforce uh, that the NDIS rollout uh, presents. Uh, good challenges, good problems to have, but problems sometimes nonetheless. And we need to be upfront about that and work in partnership with the sector to deliver those outcomes and, and to make the most of the potential, the almost limitless potential, that the biggest reform in social services, the biggest social policy reform, although I think it's as much economic reform as anything else, uh, the NDIS presents us with a challenge but a great opportunity, an historic opportunity. And I think Victoria whether it be from the earliest pilots or through to ultimate delivery, Victoria will rise to that challenge, this sector will rise to that challenge, and we will indeed be leaders and continue to be leaders in that important exercise. We've gone, we've provided substantial support to the Navigator program, helping more kids stay at school. Uh, our participation plan, uh, whether it be uh, in training or in employment, uh, really is delivering fantastic outcomes, particularly for. Uh, clients uh, of uh, disability services across the state. In a more transactional sense, pretty plain and simple, the utility relief grant moving from $500 to $650 for the first time in almost 10 years uh, is a substantial investment and improvement, and I know something that VCOS campaigned for very strongly. Some of those things are not big ticket items. Some of them won't necessarily be on the front page of the paper. Uh, are on the news at night, but they are really important and they do make a big impact in the lives of so many people. And one of the, there are many key common elements to those stories and those different achievements, but there's a thread through all of them. And I think it, in large part, it's this sector and its advocacy and the work of its peak and the partnership that we have with VCOS that has helped inform each of those decisions, each of those investments and that agenda both in the formation of promises before the election and the delivery of them since. So, again, that's another way of saying thank you. Now, I did say I wanted to reflect just a little bit on one area of policy that we did make substantial promises in and that we have delivered faithfully against, although that's not to say that there isn't still a very long way to go. I'm, of course, talking about family violence and uh, violence against women in the Victorian community. We made that commitment that we would have Australia's first ever Royal Commission into Family Violence. That wasn't necessarily instantaneously supported by everybody. Some people thought that that would become a lawyer's picnic and that it wouldn't necessarily be the best way to go. Uh, I would say to those people respectfully, uh, in my judgement, 
Uh, true leadership is the acknowledgement of not having the answers, not always imposing what you believe to be the answers on everybody. Uh, my, my father taught me very, very poignantly, and I won't share how he might have reinforced these lessons, but he taught me that wisdom comes from listening and that outcomes come from hard work. And when you combine both those things together, you can do truly powerful things. So we said we would have a Royal Commission and uh, despite some cynicism, and some of it was well justified, uh, for a long time governments and people like me had made big promises and talked a big game when it came to dealing with what is still our biggest law and order challenge, not just in Victoria but right across our country. Uh, but that cynicism I think was confounded when we established the Royal Commission uh, and when it handed down its 227 recommendations back in 2016, uh, I'd like to think that we confounded any cynicism or doubts that might have existed across the community when we said that we would implement every single one of those 227 important recommendations. Not just in words, though. Uh, we then proceeded over two budgets to uh, dedicate $2.6 billion to this important task, keeping women and children safe and making sure that we led our nation. Now, this is not, well, it is, I suppose, a reflection of our sincerity, or I'd hope it be seen that way. But that $2.6 billion is more than the entire investment if you add up every other government in this country. That is less than the $2.6 billion that we are investing in this important important reform. Uh, that should be a source of pride for every Victorian, because we don't do it for ourselves, we do it on behalf of so many. We shouldn't have to lead in that way. Perhaps others should be doing more as well. But we are proud to have made those investments. We're shocked by the need to, uh, and we're challenged by the need to. But we are delivering very real results in this important area. And it's all because we had the courage, I think, to say, well, we don't have all the answers. We have some of them, yes. We don't have all the answers and we don't truly understand all the connectedness or lack of that across a diverse, richly diverse sector. And to everybody in this room and many beyond it who are involved in that important work, I am very, very grateful. Very grateful. And we will continue to provide the leadership and the resources to deal, to deal with this challenge and to make sure that we remain true to our commitment to implement faithfully each and every one of those 227 recommendations. In many respects, nothing is more important than that. We have seen attitudinal change, but still a long way to go in that front as well. We are teaching our kids about these issues. We have brought this out into the open, and I think that lives are being saved because of that. Uh, it's often said that bad attitude, bad outcomes for Victorian women begin with bad attitudes toward Victorian women. That's true and it will remain so, uh, but we are making some progress. We are making some progress and perhaps the ease with which we engage on these issues, whether it be in social marketing and behaviour change campaigns on TV, respectful relationship, uh, ed proper education in our schools uh, and leaders of, leaders of communities giving speeches like this, hopefully we, that too is a symptom that we have come a long way, notwithstanding the fact that we have much more work to do still. That brings me to the subject of much more work and challenges that I've been giving some thought to in recent times. Uh, and when I think about it, um, I've actually been pondering these issues for a long time in different roles that I've been given over my time in public life. Uh, there is an issue that remains all too often silent and, stigma and stigmatised, all too often away from, away, from the, away from the foreground of policy and political debate and ultimately decision making. And that is, of course, mental illness. Right now, we know that the stats tell us that one in five Victorians is living with a mental illness. Uh, experts tell us that that number is substantially higher than that substantially higher than that. The other way to put it, I suppose, is either directly or indirectly somebody we love or care about, somebody we work with, a teammate, a neighbour, a friend. We are, all of us, five in five, affected and touched and challenged by mental illness in our community and appropriately responding to it. 
The recent state budget, of course, delivered the biggest boost that this sector has ever seen. Uh, and again, that's not, I don't make that point in any sense of uh, being, I suppose, triumphant. Uh, it, is, it is sad in some respects that we have to invest quite so much, but it's a challenge that we have to meet. It's a challenge that we have to rise to. That $705 million supported new inpatient beds, new regional re rehabilitation services and facilities, noting the comorbidity between so often substance abuse, abuse and some types of mental illness. Six new emergency department crisis hubs so that we can, in a more dignified way and in a safer way for all concerned, provide support and care for those clients that are in crisis. Uh, but as important as those investments are, as important as that $705 million is and will be in changing lives and for some saving lives, we all know that there is so much more that we need to do in this space. And again, a little bit like family violence, we need to have the courage to acknowledge that we do not have all the answers. We have many of them, and we have many people of goodwill and amazing ability and insight that we can draw on. I've been giving some thought to this in recent times, and when you think about, there, there is a, an, an ocean of um, metrics and statistics and numbers in this and they are, all of them, not particularly good. The, the number of people who take their own life every year is staggering. And it is a challenge to all of us, a call to action for every leader in this state and in this country. You can't help but be touched when you read in some detail about a regional community, a farming community, where in just a 12-month period, that community lost 50 people. You can't help but be touched by that and shocked and pushed to do more and to do better. You can't help but be impacted very deeply, very powerfully, well beyond politics, when you hear about uh, when your daughter comes home and tells you that one of her classmates, a 13-year-old, has taken their own life. You can't help but be challenged when you hear story after story not just in your public life or in your professional life, but as a father, as a partner, as a member of a local community. This is very real and all too tragic. And it is a call to action for all of us. The, the real challenge here is to make sure that we come up with a package of reform and a process of engagement that respects all of those who work in each part of our mental health service system. The challenge as well is to be honest about those areas that are failing. And the challenge as well, perhaps the biggest and most important challenge, is to have the determination to know that this will cost a very large amount of money, but that those who are vulnerable and those who in turn love them and are made vulnerable by mental illness are worth every single dollar. I'll have more to say about this in coming weeks and months, and I hope that you'll be able to join us on, uh, on, on a journey, on a process uh, that I think will deliver real benefits for those in the community who experience and live with mental illness to deal with the fact that today eight Australians will take their life to deal with today so many people and so many of the issues that you are all fundamentally concerned about have at least in part some of their underlying cause that can be attributed back to mental illness and not appropriately treating and caring for those vulnerable Victorians. John McGrath, who was a fantastic member of the Victorian Parliament on, on the other side of politics, but a fantastic person and someone that I uh, had a bit to do with in previous roles. He gave a, a profoundly powerful speech in the Victorian Parliament where he asked his colleagues to walk with him. Uh, he had very personal, uh, very, very, a per very personal story in relation to uh, two of his boys. Uh, I'm not here today to give one of those speeches. I'm simply here to acknowledge that whilst we've been talking about this issue for a long time, uh, we've got a long way to go. And we are failing so many people. We as a community and different sectors, we are failing some of the most vulnerable 
in the worst way. As I said, I've been giving some thought to this. I recently reread the Burdekin report 25 years on. Uh, yeah, we have come a long way, but there's some things that we said we'd do that we didn't. Uh, it's 1954. The World Health, World Health Organization said that there can be no physical health without mental health. And all these years later, uh, we are still called to action. Well, I'm determined to do something about this. And as I said, in coming weeks and months, I'll have more to say about it. Let me finish simply by saying that in that enterprise, in all the work that you do, in all the things that are important to us as a government and as a community, the role you play, the purpose you bring, the passion you bring to, to the work that you do, uh, you should be so very proud, so very proud. And I'm proud to think that Victoria has the most vibrant social services sector anywhere in our nation and perhaps in the world. And we'll continue to support you because that support in turn makes us a fairer, a more just, a more decent, a better Victoria in every sense of that term. Thank you so very much.